there's a lot of discussion going on in the chat, but I'm going to ask the room to take a more active approach to discussing open academic practice. It would be ironic in the extreme if we had a session on open academic practice, uh, particularly following this sort of reflection in action, reflection on action, and just, again, delivered something. So. You will all notice on the, uh, on the whiteboard, I hope, that there are some whiteboard tools. There is, for example, a little uh, a line drawing tool, uh, a pen tool, and, uh, if you, and you can do things like change the color of these pens. So I've just got myself a purple pen, and I'm drawing on the board. And somebody else's excellent drawing on the board. <laughs> and so on. OK, so you're all familiar, or some of you are familiar enough with this. And those of you who perhaps have not done this before will be able to very quickly pick up the process. Can I call your attention to another one of the tools, which of course is the, uh, the writing tool. Um, you can drop some text on the screen by picking up the writing tool and, and typing it in. So uh, I've just, yes, typed it in. And you can choose serif fonts or sans serif fonts. And you can make them really big, or you can make them more uh, smaller and so on. So the next slide, <laughs> I love the pictures coming in. Uh, um, I suppose it was probably polite not to have introduced this too much earlier. Or we could have been defacing um, our colleagues' slides as we go through. Uh, let me turn my video on, because people seem to like to have the video. There, can you see my video? Hello, everybody. Um, back in with the, the video again. Um, I guess that's a hello. Yep. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next slide, which will be some questions. And what I'd like you to do is, using the text tool, write directly onto the board some things that you think are aspects of openness, dimensions of openness, what might be openness for you. And so I'll leave this for just a minute up here. And people are saying sharing, sharing indeed. Um, so let's get some collaboration, free, freedom. Is that free as in freedom or free as in free lunch? That uh, good old challenge from, uh, oh gosh, I've forgotten his name now, but the whole open source software movement and uh, the GNU open licensing. Sharing free beer. <laughs> openness is being quick to question our assumptions. I think that's really good, being open to yourself. Evidence. Richard Stallman, thank you very much. Whoever typed Richard Stallman's name up there. Um, here, I will give you a memory stick for your <laughs> prize. Uh, not that one. I'll have to format it. Um, vulnerability. Yes, risk is, a, is an important thing. This came up in the text chat earlier. Um, the, I think it was uh, Haley who mentioned that open um, learning environments represented a risk, particularly to people who had been in education for a long time. Um, and uh, they may have to learn new practices. Community, equality, creative commons. Yes, so we're getting a, a mix of sort of practices and a mix of um, instruments, if I can call them that, which enable the practice. So I see creative commons and things like the GNU open license are instruments by which openness can be realized in the world. Um, getting things off your hard drive, indeed, getting it up onto the web. Truth, equity, gratuity. Where did my writing go? Um, 
some people you can scroll the writing and you can resize your text boxes. Oops! I think I just you know I'm not good. Sharing copyright. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, well we've got the idea and we started to get some um, ideas and, and the next slide uh, again, you may uh, disagree. There's been a tremendous amount here that talks about openness um, and, and what openness might mean for people. I put a few dimensions down which um, in educational practice have been um, around for, for a while. So the openness in respect to time or schedule openness with start-stop times, openness with pace. So this course isn't entirely open. It has a particular start date. It has a particular end date. There are times when there will be speakers in live sessions. There are times when activities are due and so on. But within that framework, you're free to uh, take uh, your own pace through it. So there's a certain limited openness with respect to time. There is openness, of course, with respect to access. And we don't ask who you are before you join. Uh, we don't ask who you are before you take your assessments. Um, and perhaps these kinds of courses may be ways for people to start to build up a portfolio of formalized credentials without having to um, jump through the kind of hoops that university or other uh, educational institution admission processes sometimes might represent. Uh, open in respect to license, again, um, where you'll see on the, you'll see it on the WordPress. I've asked you to put it on the Moodle as well, but I haven't seen it appear on the Moodle yet, um, that this course is licensed um, to the extent that it's within my gift to do so, Creative Commons share alike. So you're welcome to reuse anything that appears uh, in this site unless there is another explicit license that overrides that, um, provided that you <laughs> open -ish, provided that you uh, incorporate the same license in anything that derives from it. So anything that uh, you might borrow from this course and reuse elsewhere uh, would require you to acknowledge its origin and, and to make the the derived work share the same uh, the same license. So you can take it, you can chop it up, you can reuse it, but you have to license your work in the same way. Um, you may notice, and some people do that. Um, we have not put a non-commercial um, license on it. So a lot of people in the educational business were using Creative Commons non-commercial licenses. But uh, education in the UK has gotten terribly commercial and it's terribly hard to decide exactly where the boundaries are between this sort of virtuous non-commercialism and the you know, dirty old world of commerce. Um, and I think that uh, we could be disingenuous if um, we say that we use it for educational purposes. Um, there isn't a distinction between non-profit and non-commercial. So um, I think we, we, we made the decision that we would just say it is open, share alike. And um, education as a non-profit or profit-making commercial enterprise is hard to, hard to tell. So. That's licensing Creative Commons. Um, I open this with respect to technology. And this gets into a whole difficult question about access to technology. And while it may well be open in the Western world, to what extent is it open in some countries where internet access is um, less reliable? I learned and noted there were people from South Africa. Uh, there's at least one person from Nigeria on the course. Um, and in some parts of uh, South Africa and Nigeria, there's really good internet access, but in other parts, it's extremely limited. And indeed, in some parts of the UK, it can be extremely limited. So uh, technology carries with it a whole sort of um, kind of economic infrastructure question about well, it may be open, 
in principle, but if nobody can get onto it, it won't be. Yeah, Kathy, uh, Kathy's whole college network system has been down for the whole day, and rumor it won't be back online till Saturday. Indeed, the internet doesn't work like it does in the movies. Um, open in respect to direction, tutor led and peer led. So, um, trying to get people to take more of a peer led approach. Uh, open in respect to learning orientations and openness to dialogue. So um, I'm really grateful to whoever it was that typed openish onto this slide. I really think you need to uh, engage in dialogue with, uh, with the people who might put themselves up to be teachers in these kinds of environments. Uh, we may have some expertise in some aspects of the areas that we teach in, but I don't think I'd put myself forward as knowing everything about everything about educational development and learning online and teaching in any number of environments. I'd like to think I was a resource that you could draw on, but I'd also like to think that uh, there's an awful lot of, uh, of people out there. Ben Samuels, it was you. Openish, coined by Nick Pierce from Durham. Excellent. Um, so on to the next question. Resource-based learning. And now we're getting into some of the nitty-gritty of this course, because I think some of the problems with um, open educational resources, online learning, uh, derive from an older concept called resource-based learning. Um, Sia so Rudy, um, can, I, uh, can I ask you to dive onto the screen there and have a few thoughts about what we might mean by resource-based learning or resource-based learning. OER, our content push, not open learning. Uh, yeah, Fred, I, I borrowed your, um, sorry, Liz, you have your hand up. I'll just ask if you can repeat the question, please, George. The question, uh, what is your understanding, if, if there is an understanding, what is your understanding of resource-based learning? Um, because the, the, the course is framed uh, around the concept of open educational resources. And I think open educational resources um, have a kind of a, a rich history going back a number of years, but there's a lot of problems about them. Uh, Fred Garnett's uh, comment in the chat stream, which I immediately nicked and put onto the, um, the, the whiteboard, OERs are content push, not open learning. Starts to get at some of the questions. There's a red question up there. Is that the learning is mainly through studying resources? Yes. Um, the, the traditional um, distance learning concept of the solitary learner with their learning pack, studying it by themselves, reading the books, uh, writing in the study guide, maybe sending uh, materials off to a tutor for marking, is the classic model of resource-based learning. But as somebody has also correctly observed, one way students learn is by interacting with content. So if we get into this question of dialogue and what is dialogue, to what extent do you have dialogue with or through content. So um, if you think of content as an object, we have this concept of object-centered conversations or object-centered social relations. Um, this screen here is an object, and we are having a conversation around the nature of resource-based learning using this screen. 
learning by engaging with and responding to content. Sounds like my, re my distance learning MA was resource-based learning, given a pack of stuff. Exactly. Things are resources. Written. So I don't want to suggest that resource-based learning or open educational resources are, are a bad thing in any way, but they are a thing which can become uh, a challenge to us. And uh, understanding exactly what we might mean by resource-based learning is fundamental to understanding uh, what the impact of open educational resources might be. Because in many ways, open educational resources and what I'll call closed educational resources share a lot of the same problems which derive from the idea that you might learn through a, uh, through a resource. Yeah, some learners work well with these. Others prefer a different approach, indeed. Looking for information yourself. Um, OK, so we're beginning to get some ideas out there about what resource-based learning might be. And again, not wanting to offer this as any final um, answer, but um, the traditional distance learning approach to resource-based learning. Um, if I just, sorry, if I just flip back to this slide, just to show you, your comments have not been lost, and your comments will, will still be framed and recorded uh, for, uh, for the future. So if I move on to the slide, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't deprive the, um, the slide here. So uh, what I should have probably done, it would have been courteous to say, um, yeah, Khan Academy, excellent, excellent example of open educational resources um, and resource-based learning. Um, where this, the whole resource-based learning world is really being inverted, or well, not, not inverted, that's not quite right, but um, uh, the idea that resources would predominantly have been text and then later text augmented with audio. I remember making distance learning packs with, uh, with cassette tapes in them of, uh, of lectures, and then we put videotapes in them. It goes back away. Um, and now we're doing uh, forms of resource-based learning over the internet. But I don't think that we've uh, entirely cracked the issue about what is the nature of learning resources and learning through and with resources. So I'm going to move on from this screen. So any, is there anybody desperately typing? I don't see anybody typing at the moment. I'll move on from this screen and just mention uh, traditional distance learning um, and then very, very quick trip across it, the open educational courseware, the op open courseware movement that MIT started. I remember about oh, eight, ten years ago when I was first working at uh, Oxford Brookes University trying to develop um, an online learning, um, online resources, if you like. Um, and there was tremendous reluctance by teachers to put their content online. If I put my content online, they, whoever they are, might steal it. And then MIT went and sort of drove a, as they say, drove a coach and horses through that argument by putting all of their content online. And so why on earth would anybody um, come to uh, you know a small ex polytechnic in the UK? And and it's not fair to you know to characterize it that way, but you know, good heavens, uh, you could go to MIT and get their content. Um, why are we all so worried about what is the value in content? And I think what that showed was uh, two things. One, that uh, good educational resources were available widely, but that they by no means replaced the education that uh, just because MIT resources were available and could be used for free didn't mean that you were getting an MIT education by mere fact of um, owning them. What it did was open up access to people to set up their own learning circles around MIT content. And we're seeing now the open courseware movement being translated into the massive open online learning movement where MITx uh, launched this year with, um, so not only now does MIT have their open courseware commitment, they're also committed to making many of their courses available 
in open platforms. So their foundation, the circuits and electronics, one of the most heavily subscribed courses at MIT, can now be followed by anybody online. And MIT has joined up with Harvard to produce edX. MIT, X, no, MIT plus Harvard is edX. There's Coursera. It's spun out of Stanford. There's a lot of big educational providers not just making their content available for free, not just using iTunes U to host videos, but actually putting their um, learning activities, their classes live online in a massive open online form. I'll just skip over quickly to say it's calls into question what the role of the teacher is and how the teacher can teach in these environments. Is the teacher what what is special about being a teacher in the world of uh, massive open online accessibility? Um, so open educational resources have two senses, if you like. There's the broad sense that the OER Commons uh, propagates, one which I subscribe to. Uh, open educational resources are teaching and learning materials that are freely available online for everyone to use. Simple. But in a strict sense, it's come to be a much more closed down phenomenon involving things that are described and discoverable with resource descriptions and metadata disseminated through a formal repository. Rona mentioned our open educational resources repository, deployed through a learning management system, and licensed for reuse in some way. So broadly, it's kind of anything. But more narrowly, um, it has these uh, set of um, constraints around it. And uh, if there is anybody out there or participating in the course from the open educational resources movement, uh, we'll see that there is quite a lot of work being done around this strict sense of open educational resources and a kind of a reluctance to put things out there that are not that don't have metadata, are not disseminated through a formal repository, are not deployed through a learning management system, and particularly the question of licensing and copyright comes into play. We'll talk again more about this will come up through the course. Um, moving on finally, and the last thing I want you to have a go at before we turn over to the, uh, the sort of the closing minutes is, OK, we've talked about um, uh, open uh, education. We've talked about open educational resources. We've talked about resource-based learning. Um, put that through. So we've talked about openness generally. We've talked about resource-based learning generally. So what now might you think of open academic practice? Liz? Yes, Liz? There's a couple of people having problems with audio. Uh, might be worth turning the video excuse me, might be worth turning the video off for a bit to see if that improves matters. OK, I've turned my video off. Uh, again, I don't know whether that will improve matters, but uh, uh, just come back, maybe my headphones. Um, thank, you, thank you, Liz, for noticing that. Um, just a little word, if, if anybody's thinking of going into using audiographic environments for learning and teaching, you really need a Oh, I suppose it's not, I was going to say a wingman. Um, you need somebody, uh, uh, somebody to monitor the the channels. And uh, uh, <laughs> Top Gun here. Um, so somebody to to um, to keep an eye on things. And thank you, Liz, for keeping an eye on the the chat stream. And Sylvia, thank you as well. I think Sylvia is monitoring Twitter streams. So. Last, last open um, act bit. OK, we've seen, we've talked about openness. We've talked about resources. What might you think about open academic practice, the third big theme of this course?
Open academic practice appreciates the learner and creates it. I think that's important, the, the putting the learner at the center. Opposed by academics? Oh, not all of them. Yeah, it's time to get the hang of the typing. Um, yeah. Sharing research openly, engaging in discussion openly, creating new digital resources. Question about elitism and equity start to come in. Um, yeah, academics want status and use knowledge to achieve it. I remember a long time ago when I worked. I've, I've had a I've had a career in several parts. Um, uh, probably will go back to it, but. From uh, for about ten years, I worked in restaurants as a professional chef before I went back to university and finished my undergraduate degree and ended up graduating with a BA in English and at that time five years of experience in the kitchen. Um, one of which was <laughs> one of which got you a job, <laughs> the other one didn't. Um, anyway, I worked in uh, in kitchens for a while and I worked with a chef who um, whose belief was that you. You, you didn't hide your recipes. You told everybody um, how you made whatever it was that you made. And uh, his argument was that if he kept things secret, then he would have no um, reason to grow, no reason to improve. And he, he initially worked at a competitor restaurant to the one that I worked at. And I was there hanging out in the kitchen chatting with him while he was doing the service for, I don't know, 50, 60 people or something like that. And the boss walked in and he was like, ah, what's he doing here? Uh, anyway, uh, anecdotes about openness. And so I felt this idea, I just thought from a, a, as a value of being absolutely open. Once you start closing yourself down, once you stop sharing, I think you stop learning. But that, that may be a, a, a naive and idealistic position to take. Yeah, you don't think it, uh, I'm interested, the question, I'm not sure who typed it, but if I can, uh, for a sidekick. <laughs> uh, uh, so somewhere to in the lower middle of the screen is the question, I don't think that it creates equity. Without the certificate, there is little equality. Um, yeah, good point your, pointy finger on that one. Um, and I'd be interested if anybody would like to take the microphone and Speak briefly about that. I don't know who I don't know who typed that up, um, but I'm interested in that concept. Um, and which way the you know without the certificate there is little equality. The certificate, the idea of certification is social capital. Um, um, how, is how is it that that's? Beyond somebody has to the microphone. Um, okay, whoever did that, please, please speak if you wish. Uh, yes, Liz? Yes, it's just typed that she typed it, but she doesn't have a microphone. Um, so she's typing her comments into the chat. Ah, right. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I was just wondering who somebody somebody did try to speak, and then there was a bit of an echo. I turned my microphone off, but then they also stopped speaking. So, if anybody wants to speak, maybe. hi, this is Catherine. Can hi, you Catherine. hear me? Hi, Catherine. Great. Yes, I can. I I started the comments about equity, and I do agree that the certificate helps, but I think it's equally is important to embrace the process. So my sense is that reflective practice helps you see the me make meaning um, of the experience in a way that can inform your professional career. That helps you, um, I think, that whether it's an informal process or a formal process, that you have the opportunity through this experience to gain something, to get closer to um, Something that's beyond, you know, your institutional walls and silos, but that is in a more open environment in terms of learning. So I just want to add that. Thank you very much for Thank adding that. Thank you very much for adding that. Can you turn it? Can you turn it? Uh, an echo. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Catherine, uh, was, that was yeah. It, it is it is interesting. <laughs> Fred Garnet, academics are not open. So then <laughs> we got a syllogism there. Am I not an academic? Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not. One of these, one of these interlopers here. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> a sponsored academic. Ooh, what's a sponsored academic? I'm going to have to move on from this because we're coming up to. Uh, we're running a little bit late now, non-elitist. Um, can I move on from this screen? You get paid by the hierarchy. Yes, I do, Fred. Yes, I do. Um, I, I take the king's shilling and uh, get beaten regularly. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, Non-sponsored academics can't afford to be open. I don't know. I mean, Jenny. Uh, Jenny McNesswood, uh, she's not here this week, but she, she'll be um, listening and then she'll be coming back. So Jenny's an interesting uh, position um, where she's independent. And um, although they, oh, it's all so complicated. I mean, the, it, it, we go back to the Richard Stallman, free is in free lunch or free is in free beer. Um, and and it, there, there's a whole set of uh, hidden curricula around open educational resources, around academic practice, around open academic practice. See you, John. Uh, have a good seminar. Um, I'm going to move on from this slide. If anybody's typing, if they could finish typing quickly, and uh, we'll move on because we're coming to the end of today's session, and there's a couple more things I wanted to do. Um, open academic practice, I won't go through each of these items. We've discovered some and more. Um, but I think it involves all of these things. Rana mentioned distributed collaboration. We'll be working on social citation um, in next week's activity. But having, having synchronous and asynchronous online discussion, and I suppose I should delete the online, really, and just say synchronous and asynchronous discussion. It doesn't have to be online. It could very well be. Um, uh, in any mode, um, mobile not again mobile or nomadic not constrained to the classroom. Um, inevitably concerned with some widening of access, which inevitably addresses some value-laden concepts, social and global justice, and having particular pedagogies associated with it. Um, these will be. Uh, available for you to return to again and again should you wish. Um, but I want to move on uh, because we believe that although all the problems noted, open academic practice is an element of best academic practice. That was one of the assertions that we made when we pitched this bid to the funding bodies. Uh, they seem to have accepted it. So I think if we want lecturers and institutions, uh, regardless of the mode of delivery, so we're not talking about whether you teach online, but whether you adopt openness to uh, in your practice. 
uh, whether you adopt openness in your practice, you must adopt open academic practices on some sort of an open academic platform. And how we do that is the big challenge, I think, that's facing higher education in these days of increasing yet yeah, globalized educational competition, the whole question of fees. Um, my goodness, uh, the Occupy movement, um, how is it going to play out? Um, there, there's, a, there's a massive, massive edifice that uh, may well be tumbling down.